joy in the city joy in your life joy in your family and joy everywhere in jesus name gck authority has announced the next level move from the land of honor and integrity comes two in one gck live in Ekiti State, Southwest Nigeria, the Global Crusade and Retreat, December 22 to 27, 2022. A new level of Impact Academy for Youth, Young Adults and Professionals, titled Recharge to Excel, December 27, 2022, at 0600 hours GMT, all broadcasts live on satellite, radio, television, and all our social media platforms with Jonathan White, our guest music minister. GCK, the gospel to every creature. In Jesus' name we pray. Our Father, we thank you very much because of this Congress. We bless your name because of the great and wonderful things you have been doing since we came. And we know there is still a lot you want to do for every one of us. We know you love us. And in your love, you will not allow anything to be lacking in our lives. You are going to perfect everything concerning your own children. And therefore, Lord, we pray that as we move on with you in this uh, Advanced 95, you continue to shower your blessings upon your children in Jesus' name. We're praying that you'll open our eyes and our ears to the truth of the word of God, so that we will live according to the word, and our lives will bring other people to know the Lord, and ours will be the great blessings to are preserved for every one of us in Jesus' name. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. We thank the Lord for the way he has been ministering to us. It's been a wonderful time to be together. And I believe that you are enjoying the fellowship of the children of God together. Not only that you are enjoying the fellowship, I believe that the Lord is blessing every one of us. And I pray that the blessings he gives us here will continue with us, not only on our campuses, but even after our school days, we'll still continue to move on and march on in the things of the Lord in Jesus' name. This morning, we come to consider a subject that is always before us. Whether we talk about it or not, the world itself is trying to talk about it. And the church will be influenced one way or the other. If we are quiet about it, we might have the influence of the world in our lives without noticing. And it might have its impact, its influence, and of course its consequence in our lives without our being able to act the right way or do the right thing. There is a lot of confusion in the church because there is compromise in the church. And the subject we are addressing this very time is the most misunderstood subject. It's a distorted subject. It's neglected subject to you in many Christian circles. And there are people that do not want to touch anything like this. But as you look at your Bible, if you're a real serious Bible student, you'll discover that from the beginning of the Bible to the very end, in every major section of the Scriptures, Old Testament and New Testament, you find a thorough uh, dealing with the subject of the world, the church, the Christian, the kingdom of God, how they interrelate and how they oppose one another. We put everything under the title Worldliness in the Heart and Conduct. As I said, much confusion arises in our hearts because we are a compromising group of people in general. I'm talking now generally about Christian people. And the compromise and the confusion 
It's just because we are not saturated with the word of God. And we are not filled with the spirit of God and the love of God in our hearts. Those who are taught of God and those who are led to follow Jesus Christ fully, they do not have any desire for the things of the world. Actually, the closer you are to Christ, the farther away you are from the world. If we could just get everyone to be close to the Lord, we will not have any problem with worldliness at all. The problem any Christian has, the problem any fellowship has, and the problem any Christian group has is that we are not close enough to the Lord. If you were close enough to the Lord, we will not even be talking about worldliness as such. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, reading from verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. In the last days difficult times will come. Dangerous times will come. Confusing times will come. That even the people who are called believers, if they are not very careful, they will not know their left from their right. They will not know what it is the Lord actually wants them to do. And then it say, for men shall be. Stop there for a moment. When it says, perilous times shall come, dangerous times shall come, difficult times will come, it says the problem is a problem of men. For men shall be. What the men will be in the last days will be the cause of problems, peril, danger, difficulty in the last days. And when you think about yourself, you might be the problem of your fellowship. For men shall be. You might be the problem of the Christian community, of the Christian church. For men shall be. If you ask, why do we have problems? Why is it that the church is at the low level it is? It's because of the men and the women in the church. For men shall be. And then it mentions something it says in that verse 2. Not in scripture. Considering self, not considering heaven. The major problem we Christians have is that the nature of the world. The spirit of the world. The attitude of the world has come into us that we are completely selfish. Many people are not thinking of the will of God, the word of God, the mind of God, the desire of God, what he wants us to do, all they are concerned about is themselves. It says they will be lovers of their own selves. All the rest of the things you have there, they come out of the fountain, out of the root, out of the source, of the fact that men are lovers of themselves. Why are they covetous? They are lovers of themselves. Why are they boastful? They are lovers of themselves. Why are they proud and they look down on other people? They are lovers of themselves. Why are they blasphemous? They are lovers of themselves. They feel that their mind, their ideas, their ideas, their philosophy, whatever it is belonging to them, that's the important thing. They don't even care about God. Why are they disobedient to parents? Because they are lovers of themselves. What they think is what's important, what their parents want is not important. Why are they unthankful? Who are they to be thankful to? They are lovers of themselves and they are so full of self-esteem. I am what I am by what I've been able to achieve. Who do I have to thank? They are unholy because you see whatever their flesh wants, whatever their mind wants, that they give to the flesh or to the mind. That makes them unholy. The root of everything is that they are lovers of themselves. They are even without natural affection. Are they going to love their babies? Are they going to love their parents? Are they going to love the people that are dependent upon them? When they are so full of self, they are truth breakers. If they make any promise and they feel that that promise is going to be inconvenient for the self, for the flesh, then they break it. They are false accusers. They take pleasure, they take joy in getting others into trouble because of 
the way they think about themselves, incontinent and fierce and despisers of those that are good. Why are they despising the people that are good? Because they cannot bear to think of another person better than themselves. Everything revolves around self. They are traitors and heady and high-minded, and they are lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, or in the original Greek, rather than lovers of God. They have a form of godliness. They still cover it with a veneer of uh, religion, but they deny the power thereof from such turn away. That's the real problem many people have. And these people, they mix with the church. They mix with Christian assemblies. And they have this problem that they just think about themselves alone. Do you think it's going to become better? Do you think that, well, eventually things will improve? Because there are people that are telling us that before the Lord Jesus Christ comes, this is what they say, there is going to be a worldwide revival. And this worldwide revival is going to sweep in everybody. Well, the scripture doesn't say so in verse 13. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Self-esteem is going to be on the increase. Self-lovers, they're going to be on the increase. The people that think only of themselves, they're going to be on the increase. But then it says in verse 14, but continue thou. In the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. The subject we're considering is based on the things I've just read to you now. The problem of worldliness is because of self. And the problem why you even have people that will hear the word of God over and over and over again, and then they just shrug their shoulders as if that does not concern me. Let them say what they want to say. I'm going to live the way I want to live. It's because those men and women are lovers of themselves. They consider self. They do not consider scripture. Neither do they consider the Lord our Savior. And I'm pleading and I'm praying as well that God will help every one of us to come out of self and come into Christ. Because when Christ is preeminent, there will be no problems at all. The problem is Christ has not become preeminent in our lives. We're talking, as I said, on worldliness in the heart. But again, as I look at the subject of worldliness in the heart, in the life, in the conduct, I see a major mistake or misconception among uh, many people that are called Christians. We do not really understand. We do not really know what worldliness comprises of. And it is very usual that when you find the Christian and the average member of deeper life, when you talk about worldliness, then they mention one, two, three, four, five things, and they feel that if those five things are taken care of, then you've taken care of the problem of worldliness. And these same people who might have taken care of the one, two, three, four, five things, and they do not have those things in their lives, you may discover that they are even seriously worldly, that uh, their entrance into the kingdom of God is seriously threatened. That's why we need to understand what worldliness really is. And that's why I'm talking on point number one, the nature of the world. The nature of the world. So if you know the nature of the world, and you know the power behind the world, and you know the influence behind the world, and you know the directing, propagating, propelling force behind the world, if you know the thing that is really at the fountain, at the foundation, behind the scene of the world, then you'll be able to tell when we say that there is worldliness, you will know the cause and the root of the worldliness. You'll not just be dealing with the branches of the tree without dealing with the root of the tree. What's the nature of the world? When I say what's the nature of the world, what's the real permeating influence within the world? 
And also you will understand when you are worldly. You will understand that it is not just because of item 1, item 2, item 3 that it might be apparent on you. It's a very serious problem that is actually within the soul, within the mind, and within the intellect, and within the very fabric of your very nature. In Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. And I want you to please uh, get these verses and get the principles out of them. Wherein in time past, ye walked according to the cause of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now walketh in the children of disobedience. I want you to notice something in that verse. It says, in time past. Talking about the believers here. He was telling them that this is not your present experience. This was your past experience. What happened in the past? One, you walked according to the cause of this world. If you walked according to the cause of this world, in short, you were worldly. Worldly minded. Your actions were worldly. You walked according to the cause. The curriculum, the teaching, the learning, the principles, the maxims, the proverbs of the people of the world. But then after telling us the external thing, which is the walking, the outward thing, which is the walking, it tells us of the inner or inward principle behind the outward conduct. He said, according to the prince of the power of the air. It says, it wasn't just your mind. It wasn't just that this is my preference. It wasn't just that, well, I want to be acceptable to the people, my peers, my colleagues. It, the fact is, you were motivated, you were influenced by the prince of the power of the air. Then it said, the spirit that now walketh in the children of disobedience. When you look at the people of the world, they don't just do what they do. They don't just say what they say. They don't just appear the way they appear. There is a spirit that now walketh in all those children of rebellion, the children of disobedience. In uh, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 17, This I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye and sport walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Now he comes in, he brings in another dimension. He has talked about the spirit, he's not talking about the mind, the vanity of their mind. And then it says, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in there. And then it says, because of the blindness of their heart. Now you have uh, the worldliness right at the core, right at the heart, right inwardly. It says over here that their intellect, their intelligence had been affected. Why? Because they were alienated from the life of God. Why? Because their hearts were blinded. Then in verse 19, who been past feeling? Past feeling. They don't even feel there's anything wrong with what they're doing. They've done it so long, they've done it so repeatedly, that they do not feel anything is wrong with what is going on. How many times do you find people like that? Even those who, are, who say that they are born again, although they are not really born again, those who say they know the Lord, although they do not really know the Lord, they will tell you, but if this thing were wrong, I'll feel conviction. I'll feel wrong about it. There will be a check within me. And as I do this, and as I say this, and as I act this way, I do not feel any conviction at all that I'm doing wrong. They are past feeling. And they have given themselves over, not unto God, 
not under the scripture, not unto the spirit of God. They have given themselves over unto lasciviousness and they walk all on cleanness with greediness. I want you to write uh, this word uh, just to help you remember. You might not have seen the word. It's not very common here in Nigeria. Wimpy. Wimpy, you spell it W-I-M-P-E and Y. Wimpy. And uh, if you travel out, you might come across uh, such word easily. Now, I'm using that word because I want to tell you the part of man that has been affected by the God of this world. Affected by all the things that uh, we are summing up together and we're calling the spirit of the age. The spirit of the world. The wimpy there, W, you, you have the wheel. Their wheels have been so distorted. That really their will is not their own. It's really the will of the devil. It's the will of demons. It's the will of the spirit that is now working in the children of disobedience. I, that is the intelligence, the intellect. The intellect too has been affected. Because it's actually what uh, you give your brain, what you expose yourself to, you will think you understand. And if you constantly expose your mind, expose your intellect to things that are wrong, your intellect will pick up that thing and be thinking in that wrong direction. It might be so illogical, but you'll think that uh, your being illogical is just a style. You'll even think that being illogical becomes eventually logical. Everybody sees you to be thinking upside down, thinking in the left uh, direction. But then you think you are right. You think that everything is okay. Because the spirit of this age, the spirit of this world, has affected you completely and seriously. M is your mind. Your mind. It tells us here that they are in the vanity of their mind. What you think of, what you desire, everything becomes so wrong and so negative. That you, will, you may still be saying, well, I go to church. You have a form of godliness, but you deny the power thereof. The P there is your personality. In fact, the devil so works on you that it affects your personality. And that's the totality of uh, uh, the, your expression, the way you express yourself, the way you communicate, the way you, uh, you project yourself. The E there is your emotion. It affects the emotion as well. You become so emotional about things that are of no value at all. You can be so emotional, it may be about the games, maybe about the boxing, maybe about uh, one a wrestler killing another wrestler and uh, tearing him to pieces. That may be the thing you become emotional about, and you're not emotional about the people that are suffering, that need care. The why there is the you. Because actually, you know, what makes up the you? That makes us different from every other person. It's your will and your intellect and your mind and your emotion and your personality that eventually makes up you as an individual totally different from other people. And when your will, your intellect, your mind, your personality, your emotion has been affected by the spirit of the age, then you, as the total person, you have been completely affected by that spirit of the age. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God. That's why you find many people who may even be associated with a fellowship like this. Maybe with the campus a fellowship for a long time. And yet uh, they say, well, I've been with you for three years. I've been with you for five years. You know that I have never been convinced by all these things you are telling us about the world, about worldliness, about the spirit of the age, about this, about that. If you are not born again, you may never, never be convinced. In fact, the very fact that you are not convinced like that, when you read the black and white, of the word of God. It's an evidence that you are not spiritual. 
It's an evidence that you are still in the flesh. It's an evidence that you are the natural lady, the natural young man, or the natural woman. The natural man receiveth not the things the Spirit of God is telling us. And then it says, for their foolishness unto him. You know, there are people that will come before the word of God and you lay everything line upon line, precept upon precept. Then they will shake their heads. They will say, you know, I really appreciate uh, this uh, fellowship, uh, this campus fellowship. But anytime they talk about all these other things, I shake my head for them. I feel, why are they so ignorant? Why can I'm sorry to use the word, why are our people, why are they so foolish? I'm sorry to look down on the people, but because I really enjoy this fellowship, I love this fellowship, in fact, I can't think of myself going to another fellowship. This is my fellowship. My concern is, why is it that in this fellowship, well, the good messages on this, on success, on the principles of that, principles of that, how can we be still so dumb that we are talking like this and talking like this to him? The things of God are foolishness. He doesn't appreciate them. She doesn't appreciate them. It says, for their foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But at present, the spirit, her spirit is dead. That's why the word of God will be counted as if isn't that strange? You know, there are people that get out of immediately we finish hearing the word of God and they look at one another and they have a kind of uh, uh, smile on their faces which is a smile of ridicule. A smile of, they said it again, a smile of, they have not dropped this idea, a smile of, there we are, didn't I tell you, a smile of, I knew they will talk about that thing, and then they will say, isn't this strange? And the other fellow that is carnal and human and fleshly, unconverted, he'll say, I didn't know you thought like that, exactly the way I was thinking. You're not the first person to think like that. Hosea chapter 8, Hosea chapter 8, and in verse 12, Hosea chapter 12, reaching to him the great things of my law, but they were counted as a strange thing. You know, God just uh, uh, made the children of Israel to hear the wonderful things and the great things of the principles of righteousness. The great things of the law of God, when it came to the children of Israel, who unfortunately had backslidden and gone far away from the Lord, they were counted as a strange, strange thing. You see, that's the very nature of the world. The people who are not born again, the people who do not know the Lord, when they hear the things of the Lord, they are counted as very strange. Let's come back to the New Testament, 2 Corinthians and chapter 4, verse 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not. Let the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, shall shine unto them. All those people who are not converted, who are not born again, except you run to Calvary, except you run to the Lord, you are a candidate for the blindfolding influence and power of the devil. He is the God of this world. He blindfolds the minds of the people who do not believe. Let me just uh, tell you or remind you of the actions and the activities of the devil in relationship with the people that are not born again. Number one, he controls them. Don't let any sinner tell me I am free. You are not free. Don't let anyone tell me I am a free thinker. Far from it, you are not a free thinker. You are controlled by the God of this world. Don't tell me, well, I just like to do what I like. You are not doing what you like. We are doing what the devil likes. Because it says the devil is the God of this world. Number one, he controls the minds of the people that have not believed. Number two, he influences them. He makes you to tilt. 
and to lean in the direction he wants you to tilt, in the direction he wants you to lean. Number three, he directs them. He whispers in your mind, don't go that way, go this way. Don't take that thing, take this one. Don't uh, go through that alternative, this is the one I want for you. And it's all the time talking to you. And you are listening to him. Number four, he blindfolds. He makes the minds of the people who have not believed, he makes their minds blind. Number five, he deceives. But then he deceives so cleverly. You wouldn't know. It was deception. That's how he deceived Eve. And Eve didn't know it was deception. I said, number one, he controls. Number two, he influences. Number three, he directs. Number four, he blindfolds. Number five, he deceives. Number six, he instigates humans against God. He sets you against God. He pitches you against God. He sets you to fight against the word of God, the law of God, the principles of righteousness, and the doctrine of the Bible. He instigates men and women to fight against God. Number seven, he cleverly convinces the world that evil is good and good is evil. And he deceives and convinces people like that until they get to their grave. And then they realize they have been deceived all through life. He does it so cleverly that you'll be saying evil is good and you'll be saying good is evil. And I'm sure you would have seen people like that that will uh, be elevating, exalting evil. And they'll be projecting evil. And they will be recommending evil. And they'll be telling you that that evil thing is the good thing. Then they'll be telling you that the good thing is the evil thing. And uh, this uh, devil tries to make you uh, act like the world or do things like the world in three ways. Number one, at the reasoning level. When you are reasoning, when you are thinking, how do I live my life? How do I make up my personality? How do I project myself? What kind of life should I live? And what kind of things should I do to be the person I really ought to be? He makes you to reason like the world. Number two, he makes you to plan like the world. And we don't have many Christian counselors, but we have all these uh, psychologists and we see philosophers and all the people of the world, the worldly minded. And they are ready to give and to offer their counsel. And if you heard some of the things they counsel, if you heard some of the things they will say, you'll be surprised. But then the worldliness begins at the reasoning level. Then it goes on, number two, to planning the worldly level. Number three, acting like the world. That's uh, where many people recognize worldliness. Only when people begin to act like the world. But that's real, really the final stage. The first stage is reasoning like the world. Second stage is planning like the world. And then the third stage is acting like the world. And these are the things the Lord has told us we really must not do. Jeremiah chapter 10. Jeremiah chapter 10, the first part of verse 2. Thus says the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen. Learn not the way of the heathen. That's a commandment of scripture. And that is so difficult. Very, very difficult. And yet it says, Learn not the way of the heathen. Ah, uh, you say, what's difficult in that? Because if I make up my mind not to learn the way of the world, not to learn the way of the heathen, I will not learn. Well, you misunderstand. Because you are thinking that learning means you sitting down and somebody lecturing you. And we have discovered that in education, that uh, that's not, uh, in fact, that's not the best form of learning. Because if I only talk to you, you learn and you remember just 10% of what I say. But if I talk to you, 
And I also make you to see what I'm talking about in maps and charts and audiovisuals and other things. You remember about 30% for what you hear and what you see. Not only that, when I make you to act it out, when I make you to dramatize it, when I make you to be part of it, then you really learn up to, you remember, about 50% of everything. When I give you the, uh, the advantage of asking questions, answering questions, interacting with other people, thinking about it, I give you a project on it, and you work on it, and you write something on it, you'll be remembering about 75% of what you have done. And then if you are now teaching other people, if you are instructing other people, if after I've made you hear, I've made you to uh, see, I've made you to participate and act and do it with other people, I've made you to write a project on it, I also call you and I say, now come, come over here. All that you have heard and seen and learned and uh, participated in and written about, give it as a lecture to these others and I'm going to also evaluate you on what you are talking about. Then you... You are able to remember about 90% of what you have learned. Now, think about the world around us. Nobody needs to actually sit you now and lecture you on your unworldliness. You see it on the campus. You see it everywhere. And when you hear it and you see it, then you are going to remember quite a lot. And your roommates are like that. And your classmates are like that. And um, if we were to be describing worldliness, Time will fail us to even describe everything you see on your campus. You're centering the campus like this and getting into all those classrooms and everywhere, getting to the halls of presidents and everywhere. The things are there and you can see everything and you learn a lot from the things you are seeing. How about television in the common room? How about the television that you have in the department? How about all those things that are there? And they tell you that, well, this is just for laboratory experience. This is this and this is that. How about the literature that we're reading? Because, you see, the textbooks that are chosen. For those who are studying languages, linguistics, and they choose this and they choose this and they choose this, it used to be just uh, Shakespeare, and it used to be, uh, you know, those, uh, li the literature that will just have uh, the grammar, the syntax, and the principles, and uh, the ancient history and all that and then think about uh, you know what will happen this way and that way it's no more like that today the selection of the books that are read and sometimes those books you have to also dramatize them because as you as you learn everything as you memorize them and it gets into your mind and here you are you are a christian and everything you are learning you are learning more from that literature than you learn from the bible and you see it dramatized and seeing the Bible dramatized. And uh, you see it over the weekend in the film uh, because they say, well, if you see this, the whole book has been acted out. If you will see this just at the weekend, then you are getting ready for your exam. And then the review uh, things, the question and answer that, you know, just to revise, go through over the whole material in one, uh, in one night, everything is there. You are really learning those things of the world. And it will be very difficult for you not to go the way of what you are reading. You may think, well, it doesn't affect me. Well, except you are very prayerful. Except you are saturated with the Spirit of God. You may discover in later life, it has affected you more than you thought. Because you begin to reason like the world from what you are reading. You begin to plan like the world from what you are reading. And eventually you begin to act like the world. Hosea chapter 10. Hosea chapter 10. Reading from verse 2. In the first part of verse 2, their heart is divided. Now shall they be found faulty. That's what the devil tries to do in bringing this worldliness into your heart. He divides your mind, divides your heart. You begin to doubt what you learned before. You begin to say, is it really so? Should it really be so? Should I remain like this? If I go, if I try the other style, maybe I will even attract the people of the world to come and know the Lord. And eventually, after reasoning and planning, you now act like those people in the world. Second 
Kings chapter 17. Second Kings 17 and 15. 17 verse 15. And they rejected his statutes, his covenant that he made with their fathers, and his testimonies which he testified against them. And they followed vanity and became vain. And they went after the heathen that were round about them, concerning whom the Lord had charged them that they should not do like them. That happened to the children of Israel. Remember once again, what linen starts in your mind, not on your ears, not on your head, not on your clothing. It starts in your mind, in your heart, in your spirit, in your attitude, at a reasoning level. Then it goes on at the planning, desiring level. Then it now comes out in the action, acting level. Now we're going to look at point number two. Contemporary practice of worldliness. I'm not talking of the outward expression and the things that we really know as the worldliness in conduct. Contemporary practice of worldliness. And sometimes, you know, as you look at all these scriptures, it will surprise you. When some people will come to you and say, well, praise the Lord, I'm a child of God, I'm saved, I'm sanctified, I'm baptized in the Holy Ghost, and I'm separated from the world. And the separation they are talking about, they are separated from the world, what they mean is that I don't choose jewelry, and I don't have any external thing. My friend, that is just about maybe a fraction of 1% of worldliness. The jewelry you are talking about, the powder you are talking about, uh, the perfume you are talking about, all those external expressions of worldliness, they are just about a fraction of 1% of the worldliness the Bible is talking about. Many people have missed the point. And although that, is, uh, that reveals real worldliness, but it's not the whole of worldliness. Therefore, let us see the contemporary practice of worldliness in the many lives of many people today and check up on yourself whether you have this or not in first, first samuel chapter 8 first samuel chapter 8 verse 19 and verse 20 nevertheless the people refused to obey the voice of samuel and they said nay but we will have a king over us, that we also may be like all the nations, that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. That's worldliness. Wanting to act like the world. Wanting to be like all the other nations. And it says over here that the people, they came to desire a king. They were agitated. Agitation to be like the world is worldliness. If you are agitated in your mind, always thinking in your mind, always planning in your mind, desiring the children of the devil, the way they are extroverts, there is no humility, there is no submission, there is agitation, anything they want, they can make all the department to be leveled. They can destroy all the departmental buildings and vehicles and everything, lock up the head of department and uh, put tear gas, use tear gas on the lecturers, and then eventually the uh, Senate will come to them and say, well, uh, don't continue the destruction. We've heard, we've got the message you are passing across. This is what you want. You'll have what you want. Then they jubilate and throw up their hands and begin to sing the songs of victory. We have conquered the authorities. And if you are like that too, if you rejoice in that too, you are worldly because you are applying the same principle that they are applying. If you come into your fellowship and then you begin to campaign like we do in the student union and you begin to say, this must change. This Bible study is too much. Uh, one hour for Bible study. We want uh, to enjoy ourselves. We want to dance. We want to have music. We want to have this. This thing will change. 
you talk to this, you talk to this, you talk to this, you talk to that. And you plan it that next time when we get there, I don't want to start because they know me. They know I'm vocal. And they know that I am a master facilitator in agitation. Therefore, I won't talk. You start it up. When he starts it up, you pick it up. When he does that, you support it, you second it, and then at last, I'll put the final thing to cap it off. That's worldliness. That's worldliness. You may not use jewelry. The agitation, the fighting, gathering the crowd together, the campaign, the politics within that fellowship. That's the worldliness we're talking about. Already you have gone after the devil and Samuel talked to the people and said it is not so. Don't act like this. They said that is the way we are going to act. And then God said, Samuel tell them the mind, the posture, the attitude, what that king will do. And Samuel went to them and he said, listen, God said the king you are going to have, this is what you will do, that's what you will do. They said, you go and tell your God. We have heard what you have said. What we want is what we want. We want to be like all the other nations. The wind of democracy is blowing everywhere. It's even blowing in Beijing, China. It must blow in the fellowship. And once you are like that, we don't want authority anymore. We don't want the word of God anymore. The wind that is blowing everywhere in the world, let it blow within the fellowship. We are gone. That's worldliness. The worldliness, you may not even use jewelry till you die. You may not use the powder, the perfume till you die. But then the worldliness is there in your heart and in your mind. In Jeremiah chapter 44. Jeremiah chapter 44. Reading from verse 15. Then all the men which knew that their wives had burnt incense unto the other gods, and all the women that stood by a great multitude, even all the people that dwelt in the land of Egypt and Pathro, answered Jeremiah, saying, As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us, in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee. They knew it was the word of the Lord. They said, Jeremiah, you are the one that had the prophetic ministry. You are the one appointed by God. Come, don't waste your time. As for the word you have spoken to us, in the name of the Lord, you see, because we know it's the name of the Lord, we're going to do it, we will not hearken unto thee. That's worldliness. That's how the people of the world behave. Because you see, they love themselves. They do not love the word of God. You, you, you plan the program of the fellowship. And you see that the problem of the fellowship is that our young sisters are wanting to get married at the age of 17, 18. And every time you see that they are talking about a marriage and life partner and everything. And then you see that already there is a linking together. Although we don't call it boyfriend, girlfriend, but this lady, everybody knows that she is attached to this brother. And this brother, everybody knows that he is attached to this sister. And although they don't say it's boyfriend, girlfriend, if this sister is talking to another brother, the brother who is, that she is attached to will be wondering, will be getting jealous and getting offended and uh, will be walking up and down, looking that direction so that she will catch my attention and knowing that she is doing the forbidden thing. And eventually when they keep on talking, if they smile, that makes him unhappy. And they feel what are they talking about that brings smiling. Is she now interested in that uh, man, in that uh, brother? And then he goes there and he says, uh, well, can I join your conversation? Am I invited? Or is it a private, uh, no-go area that only two of you can talk about? Well, whether you invite me or not, I am here, I am here. And then eventually after that, uh, you know, he cuts everything short 
And then while he tries to use his uh, worldly intelligence and everything to part them, then he says, Sister, don't go yet. I, in fact, I wanted to see you before. I was looking for you, then I saw you here. Uh, we need to talk. And then after that, they come apart. Well, I hope there's nothing else. I hope that you are not discussing anything that, uh, well, don't give me hypertension. Don't make me fail my exam. Don't make me uh, a loser in my Christian life. Uh, because, well, I won't talk. If I talk half, it becomes whole in your mind. You understand? And then we say we don't have girlfriend. What's that? We say we don't have boyfriend. What's that? And then when we see that in the fellowship, these are the things going on, then the people in that fellowship to correct everything, and uh, then they, they put on equal yoke, they put uh, being serious with our academics, they put a lot of things, and then they call people to come and talk to us in the fellowship. And immediately somebody comes and he gives us the word. Immediately after that, some people pray, they cry, they shout and everything, there are people that come out and they will call their girlfriend. They don't call them girlfriend, but they are girlfriends. They will call their boyfriends and they will say, don't listen to them. As for Second Corinthians chapter 6, we will not hack him. We will not leave this fellowship. In fact, we are going to remain in this fellowship. We are going to change this fellowship. All this holiness, sanctification, righteousness they are talking about, we will change this thing. We have only three sessions to go. We have only four sessions to go. Before we leave this campus, we're going to turn everything around. What's that? That's worldliness. That's how they do it in the world. That's how they say they are going to change everything. They go from agitation to rebellion. And if we have rebellion, we have stubbornness, we, we are stubborn in error. We are stubborn in evil. If we are stubborn in error and evil, we are rebellious. It is worldliness. Look at uh, Philippians chapter 2. In Philippians chapter 2, reading from verse 20 and verse 21. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all men seek their own not the things which are Jesus Christ. That's selfishness and carnal pursuit. Selfishness and carnal pursuit. Now you see when that is taking place, we know that there's worldliness there. And if you look at the lives of the young people on the campus, although we say that we are better than the other fellowship, we are higher than the other fellowship, we are deeper than the other fellowship, we are more scriptural than the other fellowship. We are more moderate than the other fellowship. But you will still find the selfishness. And everything that some people do, everything is capitalized and built and based on self. And Paul the Apostle said here, yeah, all seek their own. They seek their advantage. And they do not want the advantage of other people they're not even thinking of the glory of God. It's just for themselves. In um, 1 Kings chapter 11, here we have another practice of, uh, the, of the worldliness that is coming into our midst. In 1 Kings chapter 11, and in verse 1, But Solomon loved many strange women, together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites and the Ammonites and the, Edom and the Edomites and the Sidonians and the Etites of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go in to them, neither shall, that, shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their God. Solomon claimed to these in love. He claimed to them in love, Solomon of all people, the son of a religious king. It was about David when life that was a man after God's own heart. And before David died, he was, uh, he was telling Solomon, he said, My son Solomon, love the God of your father. Seek him. Follow him. 
If you forsake him, he'll forsake you forever. And then his father died. God appeared unto him. At that beginning, he loved the Lord. And he said, O oh Lord, give me wisdom. And God gave him wisdom. And eventually people started to visit him. This one will visit him, that one will visit him, and they really recognized them. And then he began to look at women. And uh, you men, if you are, even if you are not using the chains that those other boys are using, if you are not wearing their, their engagement ring that they are wearing, and if you are not having what the boys are doing now, they have a ring on one ear, they have nothing on the other ear, they go to uh, uh, pierce their ears. If you are not doing that, but then you are eyeing the ladies of the world who are in your department. And you'll be looking at them and uh, wondering, ah, ah, this one is like a specimen from the hand of the Almighty God. How can she just be like this? And they are so scantily dressed that uh, it's so unfortunate on our campuses. And they do that, uh, you know, for their various purposes. And you know that they are the most familiar. If you really want to have an idea what the question paper looks like, you know that if you get nearer to them, they are nearer to the lecturers than you are. Because uh, by the sale of their body, and by the sale of uh, the delicate part of their body, uh, they will have not only question paper, they will have a lot of other things. And uh, you know there are boys too that if they cannot give their body, then they give money in substitution. Or they become a middle man, a middle boy between lecturer and another girl. You know this uh, politics and the, the enormous uh, kind of uh, immorality that goes on on the campus. And then you, you say you are a Christian. Although when you are in the fellowship, you'll be preaching against it. And you'll be saying immorality is a deadly sin. This one is bad and this one is bad. But when you come out of that fellowship and you see those uh, boys and girls and as they are talking and you see them the way they are almost naked, you'll be saying, if I were not a Christian. But somebody, somebody is a Christian now. But God will forgive. But even though God will forgive, if I go near this uh, direction now, other brothers will say, Ah, brother, what's happening? Are you backsliding? Are you backsliding? In your heart you have gone already. Because although you have not done it publicly, but you know in your heart you are, you are longing. And you uh, ladies uh, who say we are Christians, we are born again, we are children of God. When you see how familiar these other ladies are with the lecturers, at any time, they don't even have to knock the door. They finish from the class like this. They carry their notebooks. They never go to the library. Why do they need to go to the library? All they need is going to be available to them. They just walk straight to the lecturer's office without knocking. They open the door and you see them. And in your heart, you are saying, well, I'm a Christian. But being a Christian now, see the liberty, see the freedom of these other people. It means to have gone. You do not really hate the evil, the immorality, the corruption, the bribery that is going on. You love what they are doing. Look at Solomon. Eventually, when Solomon got uh, uh, sold these uh, women, then he got this one. Marry this one, marry this one, marry this one. You talk of polygamy, that man was a polygamist. Do you know how many women eventually he had? I don't know uh, how he was able to control them. Because, uh, you know, for a lecturer to control a class of 50 or 100, that is really a serious matter. And if all those in the class were women, uh, when you have 100 women, the, 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 the volume, the amount of jealousy in the midst of 100 women, who can contain that? But look at this man. I want you to look at verse 3. And he had 700 wives. Wives? There are only 365 days in the year. When does he get to every one of them? That's what we are talking about. He was an Israelite. But look at what happened to him. And he had all these wives and princesses and 300 concubines. And his wife turned away his heart. You see, that's what an equal yoke will do. You know, it, it, it just amazes me. Just surprises me. How a lady 
can be in a fellowship like this, Deeper Life uh, Campus Fellowship, and go through all these uh, Bible studies and congresses and conferences and listen to the cases and read the campus peer and fellowship with us and pray with us and eventually end up marrying an unbeliever. It suppresses me. I still can't understand how a person, a man, that uh, would have gone through the Bible studies and everything, eventually will go and marry somebody that is uh, all a child of the devil, the carriers of uh, HIV and AIDS. I'm surprised. Because, uh, you know, all these, uh, I, I don't like to use the word beautiful or fine, because uh, they repel me. I don't know about you, but when I see a lady that is not having enough common sense to be dressed, a lady, you know, when I was young, it's uh, the mad people that I see are naked. How about you? Okay, things are different now. You are still young. When I was young, it's the mad people that I see that were naked. And then you come across these people, and uh, you see them, they are almost naked, and I say, and these have gone to university. What are they learning? What are they teaching them? There's no common sense. There's no propriety of anything. And they repel me. They repel every child of God. When I see a person that the hand is, uh, the hand is almost white, the face is almost white, the neck is black, and the leg is black. And I say, what kind of chameleon is this? What kind of a snake is this? That you have yellow here, you have white here, you have gray there, you have black there. What's wrong with them? They repel me. And when I see a young man that will see all these chameleons, all these people, the head is bunch, uh, the face is almost white, the hands are black, and every other part, and then you have the crocro, you have the other, you know, the other things that they cannot expose. Then you have the AIDS and the virus and everything there. And I see somebody carrying Bible. And somebody who says, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. And he's addressing near them and going near them and saying, what's your name? Where do you live? Uh, are you steady? Uh, do you already have uh, somebody? And uh, well, I don't like to say directly to you, you know, I'm a Christian. But, uh, you know, Christians are loving people. There you are. They have gone. When I see people like that, I say, where are these people coming from? Where were they born again? Have they ever met Jesus Christ? If we know the Lord, you will not go in that direction. Look at Solomon. Eventually Solomon cried out, vanity of vanities, all is what? All is vanity. I see you are getting quiet on me now. I'm getting into unpopular area. And I'm not finished yet. Because I still have a lot of material. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Now, I mean, I mean, the passage you have been waiting for me to read, that's in Isaiah chapter 3. Isaiah chapter 3, reading from verse 16. Moreover, the Lord says, Because the daughters of Zion are haughty, and walk with stretched forth necks, and went on eyes, walking and missing as they go, making a tinkling with their feet. You know the lie of the devil. The lie of the devil is, they say God doesn't worry about our body. God doesn't worry about what we put on. God doesn't worry about uh, our appearance. All he worries about is the holiness in the heart. Rubbish. Because here it says, Moreover, the Lord saved that the daughters of Zion, they are haughty, and they walk with stretched forth necks, and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go, and making a tinkling with their feet. Then he talks about the judgment that will come upon them. And as you read everything, you will see it is real judgment that comes upon them. The jewelry, the painting, the palming, and you know, if you are this age, if you don't know, I think I ought to tell you. And uh, if you have done the uh, palming before, that thing is very terrible. You, you go and you put your head under that heat. And if you can endure that, I don't know why you cannot come into the church and endure a little persecution. Because if a lady can endure that thing under that terrible fire, 
I think that thing is very serious. Very, very serious. But you know, when you burn it, and you burn it, and you burn it, then it will be getting off and off and off. By the time you become 35 or 40, the whole thing is gone. Yeah, because you have burnt your own, you have to go and borrow the animal's own. And then you'll be carrying it about. And all these people of the world, they don't, you see, before we make fun of them, they, they, they coin a good language. When they have lost their natural air, they have burnt everything up, and then they borrow another one, they don't want to face the fact that they are borrowing it from the animal. They say it is attachment. It is because you have lost the real thing that you need attachment. And then they will stay there and then after all that is uh, gone, eventually they go for another one again and it's a terrible thing. I pray that you who are children of God, you remain real children of God in Jesus' name. And uh, maybe you are, you, are, you are there today and you know even in our meeting here, I see a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of people, I really don't understand why they are like that. Uh, sisters, or maybe ladies, why should I call them sisters? Pardon me. You see, ladies, they, they still go about here, they have their earring there, they have their earring there, they have the other one there, they have the one in the head there, they have this other one coming out, and then as I, I don't move around a lot, but I move around a little, I, I say, look at that one with attachment. In a place like this, where the holiness of God, the power of God is moving a lot, look at all these attachments. If I had my chance, if I had my way, I will get to them and yank up that thing. And say that as a child of God, if you are going to be a child of God, be a child of God. If you cannot do it, I'll do it for you and yank it up and throw it away. But I think that it's time by the grace of God, we really sit up, we say by the grace of God, I'm going to live a righteous life and it will be done in Jesus' name. So that we'll say, let the church be the church, let the world be the world. The world is over there, the church is over there, and by the grace of God, we are standing on the word of God in Jesus' name. It means that you will not have an equal yoke, it means you will not have the appearance of the world. You know what? The appearance of the world repels God. It only attracts the world. Whatever attracts the world repels the almighty God. And the pornography. I, I can't understand. I can't understand how a person that says I'm born again. I'm a child of God. He will, in the private, he'll take a pornographic magazine. With all these uh, nude, naked uh, girls. And they never do well. And they drop out. That can uh, make a posture before a camera. Almost naked. And then they draw all those things there. And somebody who says I'm a Christian. Which kind of Christian? I'm a Deeper Life member. I, if I knew where they wrote your name in Deeper Life Register, I'll go and rub it off. And then they will, they will get there and they'll be looking at all those uh, pictures, all those pictures, and then when they come for prayer meeting, they'll be confessing and crying and uh, say, oh God, forgive me, oh God, forgive me. And then after the prayer meeting, they go to their pornography magazine again. They're not Christians. They're not born again. If you're a real child of God, all that is gone. And of course, there will be no gambling. And all these night parties, birthday party, this one party, social party, drinking party. If you're a real child of God, it will not be there. Or theater going, or the social drinking, or the smoking, or the, the seduction, the tempting of other people to get them into trouble. If we're real children of God, we're not going to have anything to do with them. Well, point number three briefly. The judgment of the worldly. The judgment of the worldly. God himself has said that he will judge the worldly. And there's no time to read all the references to you. Let me just uh, read this. The words of the Lord Jesus Christ to you. In Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17, verse 32. Jesus said, Remember Lord's wife. Remember Lord's wife. If you remember the story very well, the angels came to Sodom and they told uh, Lord that God was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. 
And he said, oh, get you up and go and tell the people that are connected with you. Connected with your daughters. And you get them out of this place. And eventually he went out. All those people, the worldly minded people, it was like he was jesting. Then he came back. He was lingering and loitering. They held his hand, the hand of his wife, the hand of the two daughters. And if a man looks on a woman, you may not touch her. You may not kiss her. You may not uh, uh, take uh, do anything with her. And you may just be having the longing, the desire uh, to do evil. Even when you have not done it, you have committed adultery with her in your heart. That's what Jesus said. And the adulterer will not get to the kingdom of God. And so, they said, don't look back. And as they were going, Lord's wife was thinking, all those trinkets, all the jewelry, everything back there, we're losing everything. We're not able to take anything out. And uh, they told us not to look back. Well, it's not, going, it's not that I'm going to carry them. I just look at what's happening over there. She looked back. She became a pillar of salt. And Jesus said, in the last days, when we're preparing for the coming of the Lord, you must remember Lord's wife. And I pray you will not look back. Because he that lays his sands on the plow and he looks back will not be fit for the kingdom of God. Now, before you pray, I want you to think about your life. Since you became a Christian, you say you are a child of God. Look at yourself on the campus. Look at yourself in your community. Are you really looking back to all those things you left behind? All the jewelry and everything. Are there some of us in the leadership of the fellowship that are saying, well, let us think about this thing. Because, you know, if we remain strict on the word of God like this, all these young people on our campuses, they will not come. They will not want to join us. They will go to Christian Union They'll go to this other one. They'll go to that other one. They'll go to the uh, newly raised up chapel of prosperity, chapel of glory, chapel of dancing, chapel of fellowship, chapel of love, chapel of worldliness, chapel of Satan. They'll be going to all those places. Therefore, why don't we modify this thing a little? You're looking back already. And maybe in your preaching, you avoid passages Related with this or that. And when you hear anybody that is bold, giving out the word of God as it is, you'll say, they're going to drive all these people. Let's drive them. They're not Christians. If they're not obeying the word of God, what are they doing there? And if they do not have any mind to follow the Lord fully, why don't you tell them what it really is? Then when they leave, we will know they were not part of all. Do you want a crowd? Are you preparing people for hell? Let's know who are Christians. Let's know who wants to go to heaven. Let's know who wants to follow the Bible as the Bible is. So that after the word of God, if some of the people pack their loads and they are going, they will know that they don't want the kingdom of God and it's no point even keeping them. Don't look back. I say don't look back. Let's stand on this word of God. And it's Jesus said, remember Lord's word. You know, on the last day, when the Lord will come, I know there are going to be serious surprises. Real surprises. <coughs> the people you thought were Christians, they'll be left behind here. And uh, you know, I know that whenever we preach, we say, before we meet next time, by the grace of God, and if we do not meet again, all of us that are here, we will meet at Jesus' feet, and everybody will say amen. I'm not sure whether I ever say amen to such things, because I'm not sure that everybody is ready, everybody is prepared to get away from everything that is necessary. And to say that heaven, I want to make it. Because you know the kingdom of God's sovereign violence. And it is the violence 
that will take it by force. All those general prayers are never answered. You know the kind of prayer? Oh Lord, let the whole world be saved. It's a foolish prayer. We don't say amen to that. All of us who are here, we're going to go to heaven. I'm not sure. Only the people that are willing. If you want to get to heaven, everything God says, this is wrong. This should not be there. You say, Lord, I agree. I give up. I give myself to you. Then you become soundly saved. Then you follow the Lord. Then we know you are on your way to heaven. But please remember Lord's wife. You make up your mind if you will get to heaven. I cannot make up my mind for you. You will have to decide, yes, I am going to make it. Remember Lord's wife? Not that she went to drink. Not that she went to even commit adultery or fornication. Just looking back. And Jesus said, remember Lord's wife. If you are careless in your life and the trumpet sounds, I have no hope for such people. But if you want to make heaven, like by the grace of God I want to make heaven, you cannot take me to heaven, neither can you take heaven away from me. It's my decision and I say come what may, whatever it is, I want to make it and that's my prayer. If that is your desire and your prayer, you will have to do something about it. Anything of the world that is drawing you, attracting you, and pulling you, you'll say, no, I'm going to break up this thing. I'm going to get rid of this thing. All the pornographic literature, all the cosmetics, all the jewelry, all the pamming, all those evil things, say, from this very minute, no more in my life, I'm on my way to heaven, then you challenge the devil. Say, devil, there is nothing you can fling before me that will affect me. I'm on my way home. And then you will be there. Shall we rise up and talk to the Lord? If you really want to make up your mind, it's in your hand. If you want to fight God, if you want to fight the word of God, if you want to fight holiness, if you still want to be of the devil and of the world, it is in your hand. Rebellion will not take you to heaven. There is no rebellion in the kingdom of God. Agitation to be like the world will not take you to heaven. Selfishness, unequal yoke, will not take you to heaven. Loving the world, thinking like the world, planning like the world, acting like the world, will not take you to heaven. Secret sin, secret adultery, secret fornication, it will not take you to heaven. All the stylish boyfriend, girlfriend, you are deceiving yourself if you think you are a Christian. You are committing fornication in the fellowship. Living in secret sin in the fellowship. With the so-called ladies, uh, Christian ladies in that fellowship. With the so-called officers of that fellowship. You are deceiving yourself if you think that is Christianity. Secret drinking. Going to the theater undercover. All those immoral things. If you think you are going to keep on doing that and get to heaven, you are deceived. The rebellious have no place in heaven. 
the sinner, the backslider, the incorrigible has no place in heaven. If you want to serve God, make up your mind you are going to serve God. Don't deceive yourself. Don't deceive yourself. Serving God has a price to pay. There is a price to pay. They are not willing to pay that price. Not willing to forsake everything that has to be forsaken. Then you, are re you really are not ready for the kingdom of God. A religion of compromise will not take you anywhere. A religion of only prosperity, looking for the best physical, material things, no self-denial, no separation from the world, no crucifixion of self, a kind of religion will not take you anywhere. If you want to serve the Lord, serve the Lord. If you don't want to serve the Lord, let's know who you are. Don't deceive us thinking that you are one of us when you are not really serving the Lord and obeying the word of the Lord. We are not interested in keeping a large crowd who do not have any intention to obey the word of God. We are only interested in the people that want to serve the Lord and follow the word of God. Remember Lord's wife. 